strange face what's happening where is everybody else that's okay so i'm here today to host an amazing amazing match with two one and oh competitors uh it's gonna be a great great time uh we got some great questions lined up some great answers lined up and some great competitors so hopefully this is gonna be a great match i hope you all bear with me as it's my first time hosting but yeah this is gonna be a whole lot of fun so let's just hop into it right away. Uh, we're going to introduce our competitors. Since you both want to know, I'm just going to pick at random. So we're going to introduce first is standing at 1-0 and is both of you. Okay. So <laughs> uh, currently sitting at 1-0, and we have Jeremy the Adam Adams. How are you feeling? Hello, Jeremy? guys. Feeling good. So happy to be back here. And I just know this is going to be a real tough one. So I'm trying to gear up. <laughs> and gearing up you shall and his opponent today also sitting at one and oh we have greg the einstein weinstein how are you feeling today i'm feeling great uh thank you for getting my name right uh, uh <laughs> that was a that, guess and i'm glad it was right because <laughs> <laughs> it always gets like einstein weinstein or einstein weinstein <laughs> did that robert it's a tongue twister and you did it great uh, but i'm excited to fight uh especially uh a guy who actually writes uh, trivia questions for a lot of the different uh, uh, groups that we're all a part of. Uh, so this will be, uh, be a fun match trying to take him down with questions he didn't write. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. So I will serve as judge, jury, and executioner today. I uh, just wanted to get that out of the way. And let's just hop right in it. So this first battle is going to be six minutes. And after the opening argument, so we'll have each of you do an opening argument, and then we'll do a six-minute uh, kind of free-for-all fight. I mean, you guys have both done this before. And then we'll do closing ar arguments, and I'll make my ruling. So, um, question one today is what horror franchise should be rebooted? What horror franchise should be rebooted? And uh, since we introduce you first, Jeremy, if you want to make your opening argument first, you can go for it. All right. Well, for horror franchise, I wanted to pick one that actually was a franchise. There were multiple films that were made over a course of many years for, for this movie. And I think it's one that never really realized its full potential. And I think it actually could be improved and be better uh, if it was remade now, and it absolutely should be a series, not just a standalone film. And that's 1981's The Howling, which was originally directed by Joe Dante and starred Dee Wallace. Um, the film was based on a book that bore a very loose resemblance to what's on screen. So I think you have a nice uh, basis to go off of. You could go more off the book. You could go off the original film. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could go. It's wide open. But the basic premise is... There's a couple that goes to like a retreat, uh, like a psychological retreat, um, because the wife has had a recent trauma and it's in the woods somewhere. And this place is called the colony and the colony would kind of be the basis for the whole series. Like everything would kind of focus around this place. And so it's all these different couples and people that are, you know, off trying to get in touch with themselves, uh, reconnect psychologically. A lot of it has to do with their sexual issues. And as it goes on, you become, you begin to realize some of these people are actually werewolves. So it's a werewolf story. And obviously the idea of psychological issues like dual identities and sex is really important to the werewolf legend. And so I think it would be, you know, really cool to kind of explore all of that again. And the original movie, you know, launched the career of Joe Dante. It was a fun movie. It led to him making Gremlins and, you know, it had some pretty groundbreaking effects at the time. But, you know, if you go back and watch it, it's, it's pretty cheesy and the sequel's really not so good. So I think it would be pretty easy to, to redo it, to improve on it. And the other thing I would say is that we haven't really had a good werewolf movie in a, in a while. And the last few that we've had, they didn't really know how to do the special effects. Like there was really bad computer graphics, like in the werewolf, I'm sorry, the Wolfman remake. Or like, oh my God, uh, American Werewolf in Paris. Let us not mention that one. Ugh. But uh, yeah, I really think we're at the point where they can do it now. They can use a good... Uh, 
mixture of practical and uh, CG effects to really give you some really scary good werewolf scenes. There's a scene in the original werewolf where a woman is, is looking through some files in one of the offices at the colony, and all of a sudden the camera cuts and there's a giant werewolf standing over here, over her. And it's still really effective and a great moment, and I think you could do with the right effects, with the right filmmaker, you know, somebody that's a really talented filmmaker coming in. Uh, I think you can really have a lot more of those moments. And I just think there, there's so many different ways you can go with it. One of the sequels actually took place in Australia and there were like uh, marsupial werewolves. And I think that was kind of a interesting twist to, to, to do for a sequel. So there's a lot of different areas you could, you could go to with this franchise. And, and uh, I love werewolves. I just want to see a good werewolf movie, man. And this is one of the ultimate werewolf franchises. So it's time. All right, Jeremy coming out of the gates strong with the howling. So let's toss it over to Greg, and you can do your opening argument and uh, just talk about why your pick is the best. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you hear me <laughs> done? God, that, that opening argument just seemed as boring as The Howling and its offshoot, pre uh, and its offshoot predecessors and sequels did. Woo! Okay, I mean, I have a lot to say about everything that Jeremy just said, but uh, uh, my movie I chose, um, I chose Sometimes They Come Back. It is a, a short story based off Stephen King, who is hot right now after coming off It. Uh, you know they're going to be wanting to turn uh, a lot of Stephen King movies into uh, great properties. Now, It was such huge, uh, still, I think, what, three, four hundred million off of like a twenty, thirty million dollar budget. Uh, this movie can be done just for that exact same amount. Um, but basically the whole, the plot of the movie revolves around a uh, 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 Tim Mathen started in the original with a, uh, uh, a guy and his brother were uh, 12 and uh, 9 um, and they're taking they're just doing like an errand going to the library or whatever and as they're coming home they get start getting chased down this train tunnel by a bunch of greasers because it's set in the 50s um, and the greasers actually ended up killing uh, his brother uh, while Tim Matheson has is just watching, looking on, and a train comes and takes out the greasers and his brother. So he's just there alone, dealing with that aftermath. And then this causes him and his family to leave. He doesn't come back for 30 years. Uh, uh, his old school brings him back as a teacher. He comes back with his wife and his family. Um, and as the story progresses, um, people in his class start ending up dying in different weird ways. And as they die, the greasers who killed uh, his brother start taking the place of uh, the people, the kids in the class who died. And he starts realizing, like, like this isn't happening. How can these people be back? And he's been living with this nightmare for 30 years of dealing with his brother. And now he's back in his home location, having to deal with the horribleness and anguish that he's had to deal with. And he's fighting back. And when he has to come back when they start going after his family his now living family with his wife and his daughter and it's basically him and just take out the supernatural uh, element that is just trying to take everything away from him like it's been doing his entire life uh, it is a really good movie it was a great TV movie that I think can really have a great potential with special effects a lot of nice gruesome deaths can come out of it uh, can really evolve into a nice story with this whole town and overarching plot line all right. <clears throat> Lots of good points coming out of Greg there. All right. So now we're going to start uh, the open forum session. You guys can go back and forth, talk over each other as much as you want. Don't actually do that. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to go for six minutes. I'll put the time on the clock. And whoever wants to start can just go anytime. Okay. Uh, I will, <laughs> I'm going to go because I go talk ahead. first. You haven't All talked right. enough. Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, well, for one thing, I don't think your pitch was any more entertaining than mine. Oh, there's a guy. <laughs> there's a guy, and his brother died. Ugh. So anyway, here's the deal: you want to launch a franchise based on a short story that was like eight pages long. A franchise on a thin short story, and then they had like what two kind of TV movies based on it. You're gonna launch an entire franchise based on that. My franchise was a series of multiple movies. It has a whole mythology behind it. It's got tons of potential. Yours is about a guy who's being bullied by ghosts. There's not too much there. And, uh, I, and I, I would just also say that my movie is, is going to have sex. It's going to be for a...
adult. It's going to have gore. There's tons there that you can do in each movie. Yours is, I don't know what, it's just some ghost, uh, like from the past haunting a guy. There isn't too much there. And in terms of the Stephen King argument, yeah, Stephen King's big right now. Let's bring back Firestarter. Let's bring back these big properties. No, let's bring back some short story nobody remembers that they made a short uh, TV movie out of. <laughs> Dude, come on. Speaking of no one members, you picked the third worst horror of the Wolf franchise in the 80s. You could have gone with American Werewolf and made that a better movie. You could have picked a better Joe Dante movie in Gremlins and chosen that as a better one to remake. You picked the worst of everything. The worst Werewolf franchise, the worst Joe Dante movie. You picked a movie where his third movie was Were Kangaroos. You want to talk about stuff that's not scary? Your movie had Were Kangaroos. <laughs> your, your movie is literally a stalker movie with a werewolf. Oh, that's interesting. And you want to talk about bad werewolf movies? Werewolf movies are boring. They don't, they don't, it's all about just the transformation, which was done great in American Werewolf in London. You don't need another werewolf movie because we've seen that werewolf movies suck, as you mentioned in The Wolfman and American Werewolf in Paris. They don't work. They're not entertaining. They're not fun. They don't do anything for anyone. And the special effects would be, would pale in comparison to what Rick Baker did. You want to, uh, everyone's like making an energy. But Rick Baker already did it great with special with uh, prosthetics. You don't need it to improve on anything. Sometimes they come back is a great story that can be involved with all of other Stephen King great stories because they're all interconnected universes. That is the great thing about the uh, about the Stephen King short story collection is that they're all connected. They all have this great uh, underlying theme that they can all branch off and create this franchise that they need to do, which is what it is doing, which is what you had when you had if you um, didn't fuck up all these other movies that they could have done. Any, any movie can be boring or can be entertaining. It depends on how you do it. And if you have awesome special effects with werewolf transformations, sex, violence, a story about multiple werewolves, characters stuck in one small location with a bunch of werewolves trying to kill them, and one of them's a sexy woman, and she's like the lead werewolf. There's lots of entertaining things you can do here. And the special effects, I think it's time. I think you can do an entertaining one, and I know I want to see it. A lot more than I want to see ghost bullies. There's just nothing there. Go ghost bullies? It's, it's, it's a really thin premise. And if it was one movie, okay, all right, let's take that thin premise and make one, try to make, stretch it out to one good movie. But a franchise? Uh, yeah, I mean, Australian werewolves were, were pretty silly when they did it originally, but with good filmmakers, like some real, like get a real crew of Australian filmmakers to make a movie set in Australia with all Australian characters and create some new cool werewolf effects. There's a lot you can do there. Where's oh, Ghost, like Bully? Where's Ghost like Bullies Australia? going five movies? You mean Australian characters like Australia? <laughs> we're going we're to redo that one now with werewolves? And if you want to talk about, like, the whole time you're talking about your movie and the colony and all these people, like, they're actually werewolves, all I could think of was the village. It's like you're, you're going to basically turn your, uh, turn your movie into the village, which sucked. And it's not the village at all. It's, it's modern day. They're, they're in sex counseling, and you they're real werewolves. The village. The village. You described the village. village, and we're talking about sex. The, oh, sex. Now it's The village fun. did not have that's real what, monsters. That's what the Wolfman's problem was. It didn't have sex. You know, that's why it sucked. <laughs> it's what it's all about. The and the question thing was, is all the question about was, our, our inner uh, like impulses, our inner lust. That's what the werewolf legend is all about. And, and our question it would was, be, not what horror franchise should be turned into a new horror franchise and what horror franchise should be rebooted. It doesn't mean it has to be a new franchise. It just says what horror, what horror uh, identity uh, property should be a new movie. You're adding something that was not in the original question. It never said it had to be a new franchise. It is not a you're new franchise. Re you're it rebooting a franchise. You're not rebooting a short story. I think there should be a lot of potential inherent. It is just two movies. They're not going to make a third movie. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Well, it's, it. Not a, it's not based on a franchise. It's based on one That's novel. The thing about Stephen King is he makes great standalone movies that entertain and create these great horror uh, iconic villains. Your movie is basically the village with werewolves. And it was boring, and now you're going to add sex to it. Oh, yay. You're, make everything better. Okay, so, so the original movies were cheesy, and the village was boring. So that means this new movie is going to be boring. That's, a to that's totally ridiculous. You, you, get talking talented, about talented, you get talented you filmmakers. You get, you get a good screenplay. <laughs> you take a story that has a lot of potential, and you make a good film out of it. Your story has very limited potential. Oh, it's a short story. Long. Everyone always talks about when they get into movie fights, they always want to talk about the movies have great potential. 
And it's always about what, if they get the right director, if they get the right people. Every movie has great potential. No one goes into it thinking, I'm going to make this shitty movie. You know, they always want to make a great movie. The problem is, it's the property in which your property sucks. Werewolves it does. are good. They All have right, I got to I gotta, I gotta stop in here. That's, uh, that's six right. minutes. So now what I want to do is do short closing arguments from each of you. Uh, try only to, what I really want to hear is you guys talking about your own. Uh, don't do as, just boost up your own like you did in the opening arguments as well. Okay, so uh, there was a lot of back and forth there, which I love. Uh, try to get some extra points in, just kind of sum up, and let's get some closing arguments. And uh, Jeremy, we'll have you go first again. Is that all right? Sure. All right. right. So so basically, we're going to have a new film. It's about a couple that goes to this retreat. Uh, The husband cheats on the wife. There's a lot of sexual intrigue. And then there's, like, really shocking, horrifying moments of, of these creatures coming out of these people and killing it. This is exciting stuff. This is going to be an exciting movie. And there was a lot of mythology in the original films that can be based on for a whole series here. I think when we're rebooting a fran- we're rebooting something based on a franchise, yes, we want to look at potential. We want to have an exciting movie. And saying werewolves aren't good is... There's a reason that werewolf has been a, a popular monster for like 80 years. Because people like werewolves. There's a lot of potential there. There just hasn't been a good one in a while. It's time to have a good one. And the original Howling is a movie that is loved by a lot of horror fans. It is a fun movie. It's a little cheesy. And I just, I think it's good to take something that had, that maybe could be improved on rather than taking some classic like Poltergeist and trying to redo it and ending up with something inferior. We can take something that was pretty good, it was okay, and then make something really awesome out of it. It's got sex, it's got monsters, it's got gore. This is something we can really base something on. I think it would be really awesome and I would love to see it. All righty, that was a good wrap up. Greg, what you got for a closing argument? Well, I hope you like the Skinamax version of The Village. Um, <laughs> I do not. <laughs> um, but the great thing about uh, uh, Sometimes They Come Back is it creates this personal revenge story about this one guy having to come to terms with his past. It's not creating this great old big mythology or this great big universe that everyone's trying to make, which is what people get in trouble with. It's this great little standalone story that has a lot of interconnected uh, interabilities with other Stephen King movies. But in the end, it is a great, uh, simple story where a uh, guy lost his brother when he was young. The people who killed him start coming back to life, and he has to defend his family from what they did. It is a could be a great little character piece um, for uh, like a Jake Gyllenhaal or Sam Rockwell who's moving back to home, and they're dealing with this uh, atrocity and this pain that they have to deal with and come to terms with. And that is a great little motivation that people need in stories which don't have in werewolves because there's no motivation. They're not fun. Sometimes they come back. Could be a great little supernatural with these great little deaths that they can make, and it could be a fun thriller, uh, supernatural, not so gory remake. And, um, you know, I don't have any sex in my movie. Uh, I don't know if that'll, you know, knock some points off me, but, you know, it is what it is. I can't all movies have sex. can't have sex. <laughs> all right. That was, wow, coming out of the gate strong for both of you. That was a great first battle. Um, I am just going to take a second here. So I, during most of the opening argument and most of the actual battle itself, I was on one person's side, and then one person's closing brought it home for me. And... <laughs> was really able to wrap it up really well. Um, You know, I agree with a lot of the points that uh, Jeremy was making about how uh, it's not going to be the village. It's not going to be just the other werewolf movies. You know, you could do something new, new inventive, get a good group of filmmakers that has a lot of potential. And I agree with a lot of things that Greg said about how, you know, it's a standalone story. Uh, it's just a small character motivation, which is a big thing. And that wrap up by Greg really brought it home for me. Uh, just talking about the character piece and motivation, you brought threw out a couple actors' names. Uh, that was really good. There were great points on both sides for sure. Um, but I, overall, I'm going to go with Greg, especially for that wrap up. So Greg is going to be one and zero oh going into the second battle. All right, I got to go, guys. I got some errands. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Jeremy couldn't hang. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's hop right into the second battle, and we'll do opening arguments for this question. You ready? What is the best Jackie Chan movie? Best Jackie Chan movie. There's a lot to 
choose from. Greg, you're up first. Opening argument. Go. Oh, yeah. Um, the, uh, the best, the one you think of a Drake Chan movie, the first thing everyone always thinks about is the action. And, you know, it's really hard to find a bad Jackie Chan action movie. The reason why I chose The Legend of Drunken Master, which was a sequel in 1994 to the previous Drunken Master, which was 16 years earlier, was that it was a great film overall. Uh, one, he actually took over as director when the previous guy, him and, uh, him and uh, Jackie Chan and the director, uh, clashed because the director was an old school horror guy, old school martial arts guy, and Jackie Chan wanted to revitalize and create something new, which he did with The Legend of Drunken Master, improving on one of his greatest characters from 16 years earlier with some of the greatest fight sequences in his oeuvre. You have the uh, battle with um, uh, that took four months to shoot with his uh, actual bodyguard, Kay Lung. You have the... Uh, uh, battle with the tea snatchers you have the 20 minute uh, final battle where he becomes Popeye and beer starts making him better and he starts losing but then he starts getting more and more drunk and he starts kicking ass which is hailed as one of his greatest action sequences and films overall throughout his 30 40 years of movie filmmaking um, it's it's a great story about how uh, he has to. Uh, he comes across these artifacts that were stolen from these people, uh, from this uh, people, and he has to get them to the right, um, uh, get them back to the rightful owner, while trying to um, trying to earn the respect of his father, whose father does not approve of how he fights. Uh, he does not approve of him always being drunk. About this is how he chooses to live his lifestyle. But it's and it's a great character motivation story for Jackie Chan, which I think is he's proving once again if, uh, in the trailers of anything like Foreigner. It's uh, that is this is a great precursor to that, where it's having someone, it's having Jackie Chan not just be a fighter, it's having him be an actual actor, and a director. All right, that's a good opening argument, and we'll go over to Jeremy for an opening argument. What you got? Okay, I'm jumping back to 1985's Police Story. Um, if you if you go back a little bit with Jackie Chan, he had become started to become successful in the 70s with movies like Drunken Master. And then he had an aborted attempt to come to the U.S. He did a movie called The Protector, which is really awful. He'd been in Cannonball Run. So he was really in the 80s at kind of a crossroads, and he decided to put all of his creative energy into this movie, The Police Story, which actually ended up launching a franchise of multiple films. And to me, this is the ultimate Jackie Chan movie. This is what really cemented who he was. He did direct, co-direct this film as well. He was the creative engine behind it. And this movie, if you think about Jackie Chan, who he is as an action star, what his movies are, this movie has it all. This is really, in most ways, the prototype. It's about a cop. He's, he's kind of bumbling, but he's also, you know, a good fighter. He, he's, he's ambitious in this police department. And then he ends up getting framed by the gangsters. He has to kind of, you know, go against the other cops. He has to, like, kidnap one of his officers there's lots of really funny sequences and toward the end you get some real drama i think that there's a lot of there's a good mix here in this film it's it's dramatic at moments it's funny and it's really it's just so amazing to go back and see how this man single-handedly created what the martial arts uh, genre can be with all of the comedy that he brought to it with all of the uh slapstick and with the moments of drama it's, it's really well-rounded, and there are individual stunts that are just standout in an amazing career of amazing stunts. And yes, Jackie got injured on this one, which I'll get into later, which is kind of something people always talk about with him. All right, that was great opening arguments from both of you. I, uh, I see why both of you have wins. Um, so <laughs> let's go into the, uh, sorry about that. Let's go into the main battle portion. This one's gonna be five minutes long. I'll start the timer and then you guys can just have at it. You ready? Uh, go for it. I'm glad you brought up his, uh, the fact that it's his breakthrough because it is his breakthrough. It is the, the, uh, the first one. I'll give you a point for that. But the thing is, that it was Jackie Chan before he really became the Jackie Chan that we all love. This is what his first foray was into the American audience, but he didn't push himself or make himself as great as he was later on in the 90s with uh, Brumble in the Bronx, uh, with the first Rush Hour, or with uh, Legend of Duncan Master. Uh, it was a great starting point for him to really introduce him, but it wasn't his best movie by far. It was just his first. Uh, and the uh, and yeah, you want to talk about the uh, the stunt? The that movie, your police movie, is more known for stunt that almost killed him than the actual movie itself. Uh, Drunken Master has actual um, has actual some of the best choreography in all of his uh, oeuvre. If you look at any of the rankings, the uh, that twenty minute battle at the end of Drunken Master is always at the top. And whereas 
uh, Drunken Master is a much more uh, personal, uh, motivational story with him having to get over his father. Police story is actually pretty repetitive. It's just a um, redundant story about a uh, cop having to deal with um, uh, bad cops and gangsters. It's not really anything um, super intense with the story. It's just a uh, it's just a normal police story. It's not anything breakthrough or in, uh, compelling. Yeah, I would say that it's it's not repetitive. It's actually the the st if you go back and watch the stunts that are in this movie. Police story, 1985. No, it's not. Let me let me just talk. So, <laughs> so it it's it's really amazing what they how they told this story physically because early on you have the in the beginning you have this awesome chase through a shanty town where things are exploding and then all of a sudden you jump right into the guys on a bus it throws you right into the story and then this you meet this cop that that's doing all these things you're like oh this guy is really awesome and then you get to realize no he's actually kind of a chump. He's got a girlfriend that he treats like crap. And there's a wonderful moment where they almost get him and his girlfriend almost get hit by a motorcycle and they like have to, he dodges her out of the way, but he, but there's like a lot of comedy and like his character's kind of bumbling. He's constantly telling the story physically. And then at the end, things really, it, the whole movie takes a turn where he has to go on, go rogue against the police department. And there's a moment where he breaks down and you really feel the drama from Jackie in that moment. This is a movie that has a tremendous range to it. It's amazing what they were able to accomplish on a small budget in 1985. And yeah, he he did you know he was able to develop this into other movies later but i think this movie really is amazing in what it did it really had it all and uh drunken master i would just say it, it's it's really a comedy it's slapstick it's the three stooges if you want one type of jackie chan movie that's sure but police story is every type of jackie chan movie it's the prototype it's everything it's drama it's comedy it's the action this is this is really okay who is jackie chan what does he does this is the movie. If you look at Drunken Master, you're just getting part of the picture. I could not disagree more. Uh, well, I mean, we can both agree that uh, there's not, but we both picked great action, uh, action uh, kung fu for Jackie Chan movies, right? Mm hmm. Where we're actually, the argument becomes what's his best movie? So if you take away both of our action, it's what's the best movie versus the best movie. Whereas I don't actually, I don't actually find anything about uh, him partially directing Police Story. Uh, it was he very well known that he over the direction of Le Legend of Drunken Master. But the fact that you're just, uh, when you're talking about a slapstick movie, the slapstick revolves around his actual fighting. The actual plot of the story is anything but slapstick, especially with his uh, relationship with his father, which is the whole backbone of the movie. And uh, with with the police story, it's <laughs> that breakdown is not a breakdown. That's just him getting over an injury. <laughs> that is not no, actual. there's a moment. There's a moment where he's on the lam and he's got to go back to the city to try to clear his name and take down the bad guys. And he has a emotional breakdown. It's really Tom dramatic. And yeah, had I, emotional I, breakdown. <laughs> I disagree. And yeah, your movie, yeah, he's trying, he's got a, an arc, but the whole tone of the movie is slapsticky. It's, it's a slapsticky comedic movie in which he's drunk a lot of the time. And I think that my movie really is, it's the Jackie Chan movie. It's the prototype. It's everything that you want. And there, there's, he's very funny in it. He's dramatic at times. The the character, the the woman that works for the mob, he he and this woman have a back and forth throughout the entire film. It's like a cat and mouse game that they play with each other. And he's trying to sleep with her. And at one point she records him trying to sleep with her. And she plays it in a courtroom and like humiliates him to the whole police force. Like there's a lot going on in the story that's fun that keeps you going through the whole story. And yeah, your movie is, it's, it's a good comedy with a lot of good comedy action. I'll give you that. But my movie is the Jackie Chan movie. Your movie is the first Jackie Chan movie, not the Jackie Chan movie. You keep forgetting a very important adjective when you keep saying that. And I'll, I'll forgive you for that because, you know, it's, it's hard to remember all those words. I understand. Um, <laughs> Jackie Chan movie, the Jackie Chan movie that people remember is Jackie Chan creating and perfecting this uh, fun uh karate kung fu drunken style of fighting which he does in the actual fighting where you keep uh when, and the whole movie is not pulpy or comedic it is his fighting that's pulpy and comedic which is why it's so great is that no. this guy who looks like an idiot is such a uh is kicking everyone's ass because that's the, what he does but if you have the emotional back through 
the the action does not work without the emotional back through of there, the story. All okay. right, I gotta I gotta step okay. in here. That's that's uh, a right. time up. Wow. So we're gonna oh do uh, closing arguments here. Um, we'll start with Greg. We'll do a closing argument with Greg, and then we'll hop over to Jeremy, and then I'll make my ruling. So go for it. Uh, wrap up, uh, sum up all your points in your closing arguments. All right. Um, I, I, uh, Jeremy made a great point. Uh, it, it is his first great Jackie Chan movie. It set the stone for the other better Jackie Chan movies like Rumble in the Bronx, Rush Hour, and especially Legend of Drunken Master. The Legend of Drunken Master uh, perfectly encapsulated what Jackie Chan would become in his uh, in his formative years with the style of action and the choreography and one fight that took four months to do. And he did it with a person he knows very well with his actual uh, bodyguard in real life. And that, that one action fighting taking four months is just the intricacy battle and if you want to talk a Jackie Chan movie, the action sequences come into effect. My, uh, I have three action sequences in my movie, any one of his. And The Legend of Drunken Master in and of itself is a better movie. It's just, uh, it works better, it was made better, it was sold better, and Jackie Chan's marks are all over that film, whereas Police Story was just something that became this franchise, and it's more known for a stunt that almost killed him by shattering his neck, um, than the actual fighting itself. All right, that was a good closing argument. Hop on over to Jeremy, sum up all your points, and we'll close it out. All right, so the police story is the movie where Jackie Chan just figured out who he was. This is the movie where he, he did co-direct the movie, co-wrote the movie, it was his vision, and everything that he wanted, because he had made an American movie that sucked, where they were trying to pigeonhole him into something that he wasn't, he's like, okay, I'm gonna make a movie that's me. I'm gonna throw all of my ideas in there. There's multiple different types of stunts, and it, it, as a story, it does work. It's funny, there's repartee, there's moments of drama. It's got everything in there, sprinkled in with these amazing action sequences that are very diverse from one another. And I think it is the, it is the best Jackie Chan movie, because anything that you want from a Jackie Chan movie is in here. If you want the comedy, it's got the comedy. If you want the drama, the drama is there. If you want the amazing stunts, yes, it's gotten a, one of the most amazing like ending stunts you'll ever see in which, yes, Jackie Chan did nearly die. He, he slides down a pole in a mall while explosions are going off as he goes down this thing. It's jaw, it's jaw dropping. It's probably the single most amazing stunt in any of his movies, but this is just one moment. There's the shantytown sequence, there's, there's multiple sequences. The bus sequence at the beginning where he's flying off, hanging from a jacket. It's amazing. This is everything that you want from an action movie made on a shoestring budget in the 80s. It's amazing. and. I, I just think that th this, it, it wasn't his first, by the way. He had done many movies before this. This is him figuring out what he wanted to do. This is him finding his voice. This is, this is it. And I love the movie. It's totally entertaining from beginning to end. All right. Great closing arguments from both of you there. I'm just going to fact check one thing really quickly. Um... All right. So here's what I have as far as, because there was some conflict about directors and writers and all of this stuff. So for 1985's Police Story, I do have Jackie Chan as one of the two directors, and I do have Jackie Chan as one of the two writers. I, for Legend of Drunken Master on IMDb, Jackie Chan is not listed as the director or as a co-writer <laughs> or as a co-director. So man, I could have, I could have hit that one. Darn, I, I yeah, be, missed opportunity. Um, Kurt Russell, <laughs> not the, the director on Tombstone, but no, he directed most no. of that movie. I'm, I'm just saying, IMDb is 100 percent could be flawed. Uh, I'm just yeah. saying what it says, it does not have Jackie Chan it's as director of Legend of Master. Yes. <laughs> we we all know he's the creative engine behind all his movies. I mean, come oh, on. <laughs> definitely. All right. <laughs> So uh, that was a lot of back and forth. There were a lot of great points on both sides. Uh, you know, for Legend of Drunken Master, we have the make something new, rejuvenate, uh, rejuvenate a genre. For Police Story, it was sort of the prototype. It created the genre. And uh, off of both the uh, middle of the fight and the closing argument, I actually have to go with Jeremy on this one for Police Story. Oh, my God. Uh, the bumbling physical storytelling and showing the range, I thought that was a great, great point. Uh, it, uh, the prototype for the rest of his movies going down, the fact that he did co-direct, uh, the stunt as a point itself. Uh, uh, there were more specifics to why, like, after you guys took away the action, there was a lot of debate on which movie is 
better itself. There are more specifics when it comes to the storytelling uh, on Jeremy's end. Uh, for Legend of the Dragon Master, I heard of a lot of, oh, it worked better, it was sold better, it was made better, but there weren't as many specifics on that end. So for those reasons, I'm going to go with Jeremy on that one. Okay, I, I guess I can cancel my errands. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, there's no shut out yet. <laughs> yeah, your errands like funneling money under the table, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, have my I, ways. Just, I haven't been accustomed to the bribing yet because I'm so new. I guess that's what it is. <laughs> I just I haven't been put in that group chat yet. <laughs> Robert, the thing with bribing is you take the one that gives you more money, not the one oh, that gives you oh, less. Damn it! <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you got me. Okay, <laughs> so uh, this next question is no one that is no rubles. <laughs> uh, no ru uh, question three is one that is extremely near and dear to my heart, so I'm hoping this is going to be a fantastic fight. And that question is, for this battle, what is the best Ridley Scott movie? What is the best Ridley Scott movie? We're going to hop on over to Jeremy to go first. And yeah, let's just start this off with the opening arguments. Jeremy, anytime you're ready. All right. Well, first, I, I have to define the question. What is the best Ridley Scott movie? Well, on one hand, yes. What's the best movie? The best made movie? Uh, but also, I think it's that director. It has to be that director's vision. You have to be like, that is that director's movie. And to me, the ultimate best Ridley Scott movie is Blade Runner. He had made a name for himself with Alien. He had brought a lot of his personality to that movie, a lot of great ideas. But with Blade Runner, he got to really make a film that was his vision and god damn what a vision it was this was the breakthrough science fiction movie of the early 80s that yes flopped in when it first came out but man it let cast a long shadow people kept discovering this thing as the years went on it created this amazing universe that no one had seen before it's 1940s film noir detectives in the future with flying cars it's it's uh, people walking among us that are actually robots. It's it's odd the the atmosphere of the movie was amazing, and then and all of that would be enough. This director had who was a stylist. He was a guy who had done commercials. He was a really stylistic director, and this was where he could really sink his teeth and create a stylistic vision of the future. And if it just ended there, that would be good enough. But Blade Runner is so much more than that. Blade Runner is a film of ideas. It's a movie that you watch. You're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. And then once you finish watching that movie, especially um, if you watch the director's actual vision, this would have come later in the, in the final cut. The original theatrical version had kind of been butchered by the studio. But if you watch his vision of what that movie is, you finish that movie and you think, oh, my God. Like, there's so many ideas in that film. The idea is, what, what is it to be human? Where are we going in the future? Like, it's, it's, and then you start thinking about, well, who is actually the hero? Who is actually the villain? This movie, like, it, you think you know what it is, and then at the end of it, like, you're second-guessing everything. You're second-guessing who the characters in the movie were, what they represent, and you're second-guessing reality itself. It's an amazing film, and it, it is something that, really set the stage for a lot of more amazing films to come like the matrix it's groundbreaking so i'll just leave it there all right that was a lot of great points a lot to write down there just finished jotting some things down and we're good okay so we're going to toss it over to greg for his opening argument that was a lot coming out of blade runner let's see what greg has in store my name is Maximus Decimus Murdius, commander of the armies of the North, <laughs> general of the Felix Legions, loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Gladiator is the best Ridley Scott film for many reasons. One being, it actually won awards. Uh, it actually had greater acclaim when it first came out and had great success. It didn't need, it didn't need years of years of years for it to become acclaimed, it, everyone knew right away that it was the best movie. And the main reason I, I picked The Gladiator, and I'll talk about more in my argument, was that there was no argument as to if a sequel was better than the original. Gladiator is in and of itself a great movie. It is a great revenge story with a great lead performance by Russell Crowe winning the best actor for this movie, Ridley Scott getting a best directing nomination, a best picture nomination for the movie. This movie is the quintessential Ridley Scott movie. It is the one that everyone talks about. It is the one that everyone quotes. It was on every poster. It was on everything. Gladiator is just a great movie with great action, great story, great performances, and it beat out everything 
that came before or came after because that is the quintessential Ridley Scott movie. All right. That was coming out of the gate strong for both of you. Obviously, both of you are very, very passionate about two very, very great movies, arguably the two best Ridley Scott movies. So we're going to go into our five-minute battle here. I'll start the timer in just a moment, and then it's going to be a free-for-all for five minutes. Uh, help us all. Ready? Go for it. we got five minutes on the clock. All right. Gladiator is not the quintessential Ridley Scott movie. Gladiator is a movie that borrowed from Spartacus, from Benner, from all these movies that came before. Uh, direct, uh, Ridley Scott, he, yeah, he did a pretty, a pretty good job doing the action and everything, but it wasn't like his vision. It's just another, it's just another historical drama that it was the, the old like hero journey. It was the thing that we've seen a million times before. And this movie does not resonate with, with people, with new filmmakers today, the way that Blade Runner does. Blade Runner took films that had come before and took it to an entirely new level, created a new cinematic language. Ridley Scott did all of this as a stylist. He created all of these things. He inspired filmmakers to make The Matrix, to make Dark City, to make all of these other films. This is a groundbreaking movie that had a lot that came after it, not a lot that came before it. It was a movie looking forward, and this is the influential one that people think about, that, oh yeah, the, the Maximus speech. Well, what about the Tears and Rain speech from Blade Runner? That's a movie that, that's a moment that will cut through your soul. That's one that any, any like film lover and science fiction nerd is always gonna remember that scene. This, this is the Ridley Scott movie. Gladiator, he, I mean, it's just one step removed from a director for hire. I am so glad you brought up that Tears in the Rain speech because that was an improv by Rutger Hauer. It had nothing to do with Ridley Scott. So thank you for bringing that up. Thirdly, which, which, um, which version of Blade Runner are we talking about? Because there are, what, three, four, five versions? Uh, I don't know which one's the best one because it keeps being five, three or four or five of them. Uh, and the other reason why it's not the best movie is because people are saying Blade Runner 2049, myself included, is better. That's why I didn't pick Alien because a lot of people say Aliens is a better movie than Alien. You can't have your best movie if a sequel directed by somebody else is better. And the fact that Blade Runner, yeah, it might have influenced some of these other movies, but you could talk about Metropolis also uh, influencing Blade Runner and then uh, influencing uh, Matrix. Uh, the fact that uh, Blade Runner is, let's, let's be honest, it's boring. The Harrison Ford performance is a little remote and doesn't really do, uh, it's not really, uh, it's just Harrison Ford kind of walking through it. He doesn't give a great performance. He gives a better performance in Blade Runner 2049. And the fact that, uh, uh, Gladiator is just a better movie overall. Got the best picture, best director, best everything. Uh, it is, uh, and you want to talk about influences. Ridley Scott tried to do it himself in Kingdom of Heaven, and he failed to equal uh, what Gladiator is. He uh, people tried to do it in Troy and Alexander. Gladiator <laughs> also influenced other movies, Sorry. and they failed at it. <laughs> Sorry, Gladiator Sorry. is a very big influence on other movies. All of movies are big influence on every movie. Blade Runner was not the first sci-fi movie. It was not the last. Gladiator was not the first historical war movie. It won't be the last. The great thing about Gladiator was, as opposed to Spartacus that you mentioned, is Gladiator is a very personal story when it brought down to it. It is the Russell Crowe's vengeance against, for his murdered family, wife, and emperor. Whereas, um, uh, whereas Blade Runner, there's no actual motivation behind it. It's just him going through the motions. And someone said this great thing that I read recently. He's a detective who doesn't actually detect to him. If you've seen the new Blade Runner, Ryan Gosling actually detects throughout the movie. He does detective stuff. Harrison Ford doesn't do anything detective-wise. It is a it is a movie that, while good, is a little bit more nostalgic-driven than actually an actual uh, accolades of what it is. Gladiator uh, was always and will ever will always be a good, great movie that people love, people want, and got the awards, the money, the acclaim that. Uh, Blade Runner didn't for the next 20 years. Right. It's nostalgia driven. Okay. Now, now, Gladiator, yes, it made a big impact when it came out. Uh, it got awards and stuff. But the Gladiator, what I mean by saying it, things that came before, Gladiator is the same story, the exact story that we've seen over and over again. It's that the hero has to get revenge and, and prove himself. It, it's it's just so contrived. It's it, And there it, it's... Really kind of melodramatic. Joaquin Phoenix is, is pretty over the top. It's a melodramatic movie. 
you watch it, you enjoy it on some level, and then when it's over, you just you for, I forget it. I can't even really remember what happened in that movie and what happened in other movies. And the line, the same you know. kind. <laughs> no, it isn't. I don't remember it. I remember certain moments, but the movie doesn't linger. Yeah, Blade Runner, this is a movie that lingers. You think about these characters. You think about what they meant. And, yeah, I've heard the argument that he's not a detective, but there's an awesome scene where he has to zoom in on a picture to try to figure out the oh, location the of the character. The enhanced scene? <laughs> yeah, the enhanced scene is so groundbreaking. Like that, like that became enhanced. something in our. We're always trying to enhance photos. We're always trying to look at images to find people. This is like in 1982, they're exactly. doing this stuff, and and it's not. We really think about it. He really inherently isn't the detective, though. He's being controlled by all these other people, and he's yes, he's going through the motions because he's not in charge of his own destiny. And who is he really? Is he really this guy, or is he maybe a replicant? It's left. Uh, to think about it, we really don't know. And that's what's so intriguing about it. It's a mystery. You go back and watch this movie over and over again, and you're trying to dig through, who is this guy, really? Is he, is he the villain? He's killing me. All these people want to do, these replicants that are being hunted by the government, all they want to do is live their lives and have more life and have the life that, that humans have. They want to be recognized as human. And this guy's taking them out one by one. Why? Because the government told him to. He doesn't even know why. And then at the end, he has to reckon with Roy Batty, who's the villain. And Roy Batty lets him live. And instead of killing him, gives him this message. We're, we're human, too. We're real people, too. It's one of the most amazing moments in film. And yeah, he improvised it. But the way that Ridley Scott shot it, the way that it was edited and put in the film is such an amazing moment. And this is something that resonated with people, yes, for years, in a way that Gladiator, Gladiator's just an action adventure movie that, yeah, I won a bunch of awards and that's about it. This is a movie that will I always gotta, resonate. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta cut in here. I gotta, right. I gotta I cut in. won a bunch of awards. Like the uh, like the be like the yeah like the so picture, like so did freaking Chicago and 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 uh, like crash. it won best picture it won best actor it won yeah so did crash all right, right. we'll we'll best. get to closing arguments here the the fight is done there's a lot of a lot of passion here which is good which is good these are two great movies so um I forgot who I had start this round Jeremy I think you started right yeah okay so we're gonna have you do your closing argument and then we'll hop on over to Greg to do his closing argument and then I will attempt to make sense of this all right. Again, Re Gladiator has some good action sequences, some pretty good performances, but I don't think of that as a Ridley Scott movie, and it's not a, a, like a movie that really resonates with me in the way that Alien, Blade Runner, these are movies that are his vision, they resonate, they've cast a long shadow. That movie made a splash, Gladiator made a splash when it came out, but it just, it isn't what Blade Runner is. Blade Runner is this movie that people, watch over and over again, digging into the mysteries. And if you're gonna talk about the different cuts, the original cut was flawed. It was butchered by the, the studio, but the core of that movie was so powerful that it still people latched onto it. They watched it, they were inspired by it. And then when Bla years later, Ridley Scott actually had the time to sit back and make his vision of the movie, the studio gave him license to do so. It's this awesome piece of art that we're able to discover later. And that, that version of the film is this amazing thing that it, it's going to continue to inspire people. And I haven't seen the new Blade Runner. I'm sure it's a great movie, but I'm talking about best Ridley Scott movie. And best Ridley Scott movie is Blade Runner. Visually, in terms of the ideas that it expresses, the amazing performances by Rutger Hauer, by Sean Young, it's an amazing film. And it is the Ridley Scott film, again. And when I say the Ridley Scott film, same as when I was talking about Jackie Chan, he brings his vision to it. He makes a movie that tells the story in, in a way only he can. Like, I could see many other directors make, have made Gladiator. I could have seen Ong Lee could have made Gladiator. Would it be different? Yeah, but if someone else made Blade Runner, it wouldn't freaking be Blade Runner. All right, very passionate closing from Jeremy. Let's hop on over to Greg for here, to hear his closing argument. Somebody just made Blade Runner, and they made it better. His name is Denis Villeneuve. We, they just proved it. And that's Not 1982. Sorry. When you're say best Ridley Scott movie is you can't have the best Ridley Scott movie and then have it be trumped by someone else doing it better. James Cameron did better in Aliens. Denis Villeneuve did better in Blade Runner 2049. It's a better movie overall. And if you want to talk about uh, acting, you're not really going to put Sean Young up there with Russell Crowe, who actually won the Best Actor. And you want to talk about over-melodramatic, Joaquin Phoenix was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. You want to talk about uh, having to overcome and make a movie? Oliver Reed died in the middle of the movie, and he had to uh, make his work because he is not a very small character. He is a pivotal role as the... 
um, as the owner of um, Maximus, and he has to turn that into a great performance. I didn't even realize he was dead until a couple years later. That's how great he uh, really Scott worked that direction, uh, honoring Oliver Reed as a final performance for him. And if you want to talk about, yeah, it was a great action adventure movie that won some awards. Yeah, uh, best picture, best actor, best costume design, best sound effects, nominated for best actor, director, writing, cinematography, film editing, music, art direction. I mean, Blade Runner has none of this. You, uh, it's just a better movie overall. It's a better story overall. Do you want to talk about how it was one note? The fact that uh, Russell Crowe had a, was this uh, guy who was a leader brought down, who was the favorite son of uh, Richard Harris's character, and then Commodus kills the king, uh, banishes Maximus, kills his family. And yeah, this is guy who was at the top, brought down, and has to fight his way back, and not only free himself, but free Rome as a whole from this horrible dictatorial effort of Commodus. And he does this as a true Christ-like sacrifice, dying at the end for his goals and the people that he loves. Uh, Blade Runner is, uh, let's face it, it is a, dri a nostalgia-driven movie. It is not that great of a movie. It is just driven more by nostalgia than anything. Uh, it, uh, it is a really it has a lot of boring parts. Uh, stuff just happens. Now they're, they're, um, it's way too uh, neat and tidy. Um, uh, the fact that Rutger Hauer gives the only good performance in that movie is that's how you can tell a director is by the performances. The, uh, the movie, the movie's the best director comes out in the performances. Rutger Hauer gives the only good performance, and he improvises half of it. Whereas you look at uh, Gladiator, all the good performances are brought out by Ridley Scott's direction. And it is a just a really bad lie to say that it's uh, been done better. Or they have, movies have been done like that, and they haven't equaled it. That's the issue. No movie, they try to do these big historical war epics, and they haven't been able to make the money, they haven't made the prestige, and they haven't been able to make the greatness that Ridley Scott directed with Gladiator. Oh my gosh. Woo. So that was a fight. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, to thank for a second. So that was a fantastic battle. I thought that was the best one yet. Um, overall, two great, in my opinion, the two best really Scott movies here. Um, there were a couple issues of semantics. There was some... Um, uh, some storytelling points that I thought were really, really great. And while I, while I disagree with him, I think Greg took it over in that, uh, in the middle battle area, because I think for the most part, there was a lot of Jeremy on defense and not as much, uh, of him poking holes in gladiator. Uh, yeah. you, and Jeremy, I a hundred percent agree with everything that you said about Blade Runner, all of the points, all about that. It was his vision. It was film noir detectives. Visually, it's rewatchable. It's influential. He's not in control of his destiny. It resonated with audiences. I agree with all of those points, but there was a little bit too much of you on the ropes and not as much of you yeah. punching back at Gladiator. So that's why, well, I disagree with it. I have to give Greg the point in that fight. Good job, Greg. I want you to admit that you love Gladiator. No, I haven't seen. I haven't seen it in like fifteen years. That's probably why I wasn't able to be as offensive. <laughs> it, I really don't remember it. It's not that good. Oh, you're insane. <laughs> I, I I agree that Blade. I think Blade Runner is better too. Blade. I recently watched Blade Runner. Yeah. All right. So, question four. This is gonna be another five minute. This is the last main battle. And the way it looks like now, no matter what, we're going to be going into at least one speed round question at the end of this. So get ready for that. But for now, we're going to answer the question, what's the best movie about British royalty? What is the best movie about, about British royalty? We're going to start with Greg this time, and we'll do opening arguments first. So go ahead, Greg. I'm going to start this off because I think me and Jeremy can both agree that both of these movies are probably the peak of British royalty. Neither of these movies are bad. They're both great movies. So what we're going to be arguing really about is the minutia of the movies compared to another. And what I want to argue about is the fact that Man for All Seasons is one of the greatest British roles of all time for Paul Field as Thomas More. He is the transcending, powerful performance given as just the stoic, uh, steadfast uh, priest of King Henry VIII, who is 
trying to annul his marriage and Paul Schofield as Thomas More is steadfast in saying no. He is uh, dealing, he is a man of religion. He has a man of principles. And even when he's about to, even when he's threatened with, uh, uh, with torture or getting his head cut off or being excommunicated or whatever King Henry VIII wants to do to him, he stands fast and does not let up. And Paul Schofield takes that role and just command, commanders the screen while winning the best actor award for that role. And which is what I want to say is that Man for All Seasons, uh, also, well, again, of both great movies, Man for All Seasons won more awards, was more praised, had a uh, better overall performances throughout with Paul Schofield, Robert Shaw, King Henry VIII. If you want to, if you just remember him from Jaws, go watch a Man for All Seasons because he is towering on the screen as King Henry VIII. You got Orson Welles as a Cardinal Wolseley, who is literally the third best actor in the movie, come behind Robert Shaw and Paul Schofield. Uh, you have some of the greatest, uh, the greatest writing uh, based off the play, and Fred Zinnerman, who is a great actor who did High Noon and other great movies, just commands the screen with a great royal performance and two great actors going head going head to head with their principles and what they want to do, and Paul Schofield towering over the screen and giving one of the best performances of all time as Thomas More. All right, a very passionate open argument there, and we'll hop it on over to Jeremy for his opening argument. What you got, Jeremy? All right, well, for first thing I want to say is, I know I'm getting semantic here, but this is best movie about British royalty. My movie is called The Lion and Winter. It came out in 1968, and this is a movie about British royalty. This is about one of the first royal families. It's King Henry II, played, uh, if you want to talk about great performances, played by the awesome Peter O'Toole, is Henry II, and then his wife is played by Catherine Hepburn, who won Best Actress, by the way, if you want to talk about awards. We can throw that in the mix. Uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine oh, is the queen. <laughs> yeah who cares all right so <laughs> <laughs> awards are so stupid all right anyway so uh so henry the second is the king this is they're trying to basically this is early on this is in the 1100s they're trying to dis define what is the royal family what is england they're trying to bring all this together he's married to eleanor of aquitaine they've had a t uh, tumultuous relationship he's made her a prisoner in her castle she can't leave her castle and so the setup for the movie is they have Christmas. This is the only time she's going to be allowed to be free to come be with the family. Henry is with his new mistress. He's, he's basically flaunting it in his wife's face. It's this horribly dysfunctional family. And while all this is going on, the three sons are there. Richard, King Richard might ring a bell. John, Prince John might ring a bell. And uh, Jeffrey and the three sons all want to be the successors to the crown because Henry is just over 50 and people didn't live past 50 very much back then so he could like some plague could take him out at any time so these guys are all jockeying for the throne and this is a this is a movie about who's going to get the throne what's it going to mean is richard going to take it and who's going to get what lands and at the same time it's this family story it's a, it's a dysfunctional family it's about these people and i the, the one thing i want to say is i think people have a bad taste in their mouth when they think about these british like royal movies like they might think about a movie like say young victoria with uh uh i forget the actress right emily now blunt. but uh, uh emily emily blunt yes like this is a nice you know kind of staid movie with nice people and they're on the crown and and it's very dignified and gentle and it's like boring 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 lion and winter is the absolute opposite of that this is a melodramatic in the best way movie with the best actors Anthony Hopkins in his first role playing uh, Richard, who turns out to be gay in an amazing twist that is mind blowing when you watch the movie. The yes, King Richard was gay. Apparently, it's this movie is so exciting, and these people are vicious. They tear each other down. They build each other back up. This is this is some real human drama here. This is not the dignified. Oh, I'm the king. I'm the queen. Like this is the movie you want when you want a British royalty movie. All right, great opening arguments from both of you. There are great points on both sides. I'm just getting the timer out here. All right, and we're going to go for five minutes in the main battle portion and fight. Okay, the, the argument you have about semantics is bullcrap. The whole story plotline of my movie is Henry trying to divorce his wife to gain a nope. son for his royal heir. That's the whole impetus no. for the movie is that he wants to divorce his wife and get a new wife so he can have a male son for the heir of his throne and the 
Um, and the fact that he's Catholic and the fact that Thomas More is a Catholic and a man of principles, whereas everyone else is just kowtowing to the king, wants to just go ahead with it. But um, uh, Roger uh, Thomas More at, by Paul Schofield is not going to kowtow just because he's the king. You know, it's, <laughs> it's all about royalty. The no. fact that this uh, would demonstrate the le next 200 years of British succession is just one of the many reasons why you would have many wars with the uh, – uh, the uh, Mary Queen of Scots uh, with the Elizabeths. Uh, you would have all of this stuff happening just because of this one thing that happened with the whole divorcing and marriage and King Henry VIII wanting his way. This would uh, uh, remove the whole religion from the arist uh, aristocracy, going from Catholicism to Protestantism. You want to talk about how it doesn't affect royalty? Are you kidding me? Just look at the historical effectiveness of the movie and how the religion takes it into account. And the fact that you want to talk about awards my, you won your movie won three Academy Awards. My movie won six. Uh, you only had uh, your only best actress won. My best actor won. My best director won. Uh, my best cinematographer won. My best writing. Uh, I had both of my supporting actresses and actors win. And if you want to talk about great first performances, you got John Hurt, R.I.P. The first uh, one of his first movie roles. You got Nigel Davenport. And again, you have Orson Welles, one of the greatest actors of all time, as the third best actor in the movie behind the towering performances of Schofield and Shaw and really Wendy Hiller, who I think matches, if not surpasses, Catherine Hepburn's role. And if you want to talk about, yeah, Lion and Winter is a great movie. It has these great dominating performances, but it's a little uh, it's a little uh, repetitive as it gets on. It's, it's, uh, it, was better as, um, it was better as a Shakespeare play. All right. So what I mean when I say it being about British royalty – a Man for All Seasons, I will say, is not about British royalty. A Man for All Seasons is about, <laughs> it's about government officials and their jockeying uh, and, and the, the religion, the, the church and their government officials. It's about Thomas More and this choice that he has to make. Henry VIII is in three scenes. He has less than 10 minutes of screen time. And yeah, Robert Shaw makes an impression in those scenes, but that's not the focus of the movie. The focus of the movie is Thomas More and this choice that he has to make about whether he's going to renounce his religion or go along with what the king wants it's a movie about political maneuvering it's not a movie about british royalty and if you want to take a performance as a king uh peter o'toole had had a whole other movie to play henry the second he had been in beckett he had this is a great movie from 1965 where he co-starred with richard burton he had built this character he had brought this character over to the line and winner completely understood him in and out and played this king throughout the entire movie and Catherine hepburn it's it's an amazing performance because she is this bitter, vicious woman who's been wronged, but at the same time, she loves Henry. She loves her sons. You constantly see that push and pull. And and this is this movie is amazing about this family, about the royal family. And who are they gonna be to see these people trying to basically become the royals that we're gonna know in a thousand years while it's in medieval times and people are dying of plague and there's dogs running everywhere. It, this is an amazing story of these people. It's your movie is about the political officers. It's about the people at the bottom who are trying to, to deal with their problems. It's not about the king. The king is a side story. The king is the inciting incident, but he's not the story. And I'm who cares about awards? Up. Crash, Crash won Best Picture. What does Crash got to do with anything? <laughs> Oscars don't mean anything. I'm talking about the movie. I'm not talking about what stupid awards some person decided to give them. Are you saying A Man for All Seasons is a bad movie? Of course not. But I'm saying that my, saying movie my, is my, my, my movie is a better. My movie is better, and it's a better movie. Am about I saying the Winter is a bad movie? This is, am look, I saying, look, your am movie I saying has, is a bad movie? No, your movie has the same problem that I was talking about. It's Our movies are both it's great gentle, movies. It's, it's, it's these the people movie having movie. speeches. It's passionless. And I'm glad you brought up Peter O'Toole having already having already built up the character in a previous movie because you want to know who played Thomas More in the play in the West End stage production of A Man for All Seasons? Yeah, that would have been Paul Schofield. He already it, understood and knew the character, and he actually the director. He's had, not the king. He's the director, Thomas More. The director. What does that have to do with anything? Is the movie about, about British the royalty? King. The it's movie about is the a king. Battle. British royalty. It is about the next 200 years of British royalty because this changes the monarchy for the next half, for the next decades and on. And my, what, who cares? My movie set the whole freaking monarchy up. It's about the right. entire monarchy. That All is right, that's, 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 that's the five minutes there. Uh, we're going to go into closing arguments here. 
this is a neck and neck race so far, so it's all to play for. Um, let's start with Greg. Go for it. The only argument Jeremy has against my movie is that he says it's not about the British royalty, whereas, in fact, this movie is the historical perspective for the 19th, 18th, 17th, and 16th centuries of British royalty because over the next four, three, four hundred years, there would be countless wars between the Catholics and Protestants over what would become or who would rule as the British monarchy. It is why Elizabeth I came to power as one of the first and best British queens of all time. It is what happened when uh, this is the inciting incident that trans transfigured and changed the entire next of British monarchy. It is all about British monarchy, driven by one of the greatest performances of all time by Paul Schofield, who the studio didn't want in the role. Tim Lindemann had to fight for him. And when you see the performance, you understand why Tim Lindemann fought for him. But he was one of the most powerhouse performances in movie history. And yeah, Robert Shaw as King Henry VIII might only show up in a few scenes. That's why he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, because he showed up and willed the screen with his performance, just like Wendy Hiller did as uh, Sarah Moore, Thomas Moore's wife. But it is about a man who, in the face of everything going against him, decided to say, I am a man of principles. I am a man who kn knows what is right, does what is right. I am not going to be kowtowed by a king who just wants his way. I am going to fight for what I believe in. And the fact that you have the only argument is that this does British is not about the British monarchy when it is all about the British monarchy and makes it what it is for the next few decades, leading to all of these different wars, the Protestant Reformation, everything that would come from with King Elizabeth, Queen Anne's War, uh, Mary Queen of Scots, everything would come from this. And a man for all, all right. is a better movie. All righty, some good points in that closing argument. Jeremy, let's hear your closing argument for The Wine in Winter. Okay, I'm going to give you. Let's say you've never heard of these two movies. I'm going to give you two options. Okay, I want to watch a movie about the British family, and I want to find out about it. Okay, there's a movie about this guy. He works for the king, and the king makes a decree that goes against what he believes in, and we're going to spend 90 minutes with him having to make a moral choice, and it's very dignified. Everyone's very uh, dignified with each other. It's all the stuff that you, you probably think about when you think about British movies. Oh, they're making speeches. They're, everyone's of this high caliber. All right, let me give you a second move option here. This is a movie about the king, Henry II, and he's trying to figure out who his successor is. There's backbiting. There's twists. A character turns out to be gay. There's amazing towering performances across the board. Uh, one of the greatest actresses ever, Catherine Hepburn, plays his wife. They're going at each other the whole movie, and then at the end, there's a catharsis where they come together. They are able to somehow miraculously agree on what... And to just think about it. This is a personal story that's going to determine the fate of the country. You know, if these people can't get their shit together, the whole country is not even going to exist. This is the British monarchy story. This isn't some guy who works for the king trying to make a moral choice. And yeah, they're talking, talking. Okay, is he going to do it? Is he going to go for it? Is he not? Whatever. No, they, th their son's freaking gay. Their other son is maybe uh, mentally disabled. Well, who's going to be the king? Uh, he's making out with his mistress right in front of the wife. Like, this is exciting stuff. And this is history. And this is the story. And for me, it's a more entertaining film. It's a, a film in which uh, you have the lead actor who's invested in this character. Yeah, yeah. Thomas More was in the play, but this is a character he's invested in in a previous film, in other plays, in Shakespeare. This is a man who knows this character. And this character is the king. And the king is the lead character. And this is a more exciting, more interesting story that's going to tell more to people that want to know about British royalty. Hey, that was All a great right. <laughs> Great, great points all around. Uh, I need to take a second to analyze this. So, yeah, uh, I mean, there are definitely great points made on both sides. I mean, you two are, this whole fight, this whole battle so far has been pretty neck and neck. Um, but I really think Jeremy's closing won it for me. Um, oh, I, thank God. I think <laughs> yeah, there were a lot, of, a lot of supports from both of your sides, you know, Jeremy said a lot of things that were great about Lion Winter. Greg, you said a lot of things that were great about A Man of All Seasons. Uh, I think Greg got a little hung up on the awards and the acclaim, just a little bit. 
Um, I think that the semantics argument didn't really hit it for me with Jeremy, which is why I was leaning towards Greg, because, uh, I mean, about British royalty, the, the answer was accepted, so I'm not going to really argue semantics here. Um, but I, I like the way that Jeremy really sold his story. It's a dysfunctional family. Uh, it's more thrilling. There's a lot more happening. Uh, whereas with Greg, uh, your movie, yes, it was about royalty, it was about political officers, it was about principles, but I think Greg did more defense than offense. It was kind of the reverse last time. Greg yeah. did more defense than <laughs> offense here, and Jeremy was offense almost the entire time and didn't really have a lot to defend himself himself very much in my eyes. So I'm going to go with Jeremy on that one, which means, oh my God. Can I make, a, can I make, to... a, con can I make a confession, Greg? Sure. Uh, uh, Man for All Seasons is my favorite movie. I know it is because it's a better movie. <laughs> <laughs> but Lion and Winter is just as good. I said that. <laughs> I said they're right. both movies. My movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I didn't pick Man for All Seasons because it's not about the king. It is about the king. It it's is. About all right, all right. The bell, no, the battle's done. Right, the battle's right. done. We're off the tracks. Let's get back on. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> so we have, we have uh, three speed round questions here. Uh, we're going to go in order. Uh, the way it's going to work is you're gonna, going to get um, one second here. All right, so in the first two speedrun questions, we are going to have to do all three because we're tied up right now. For the first two speedrun questions, uh, you're going to get 20 seconds, and then you're going to get 10-second rebuttals, and then the third round is going to be three two, Wouldn't that be it? What? If someone wins the first that two, wouldn't that be it? Yes, sorry. My bad. Yeah. Yes. That's correct. The f so it's best two out of three for these speed round questions right now. Uh, the rest of the match doesn't really matter as far as who wins at this point because we're all tied up. So it's best two out of three. Uh, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to ask the question. You're going to shout out your answer. Uh, whoever I hear answer first, they're going to get to argue that option. And whoever the other person is going to get the other option. That's how it's basically going to work. So the first question is an either or. I'm going to name two movies. You have to. Tell me which one is bad questions. Do we do we try to call it out? And you yep, say who yep. says it for okay. Yep. So you're gonna call out which of these two movies is better. Yeah. Whoever answers first is gonna get that option that they yelled out. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. All right. So which is a better movie? Crazy Stupid Love or La La Land? I, I can't hear you. La La Land. I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. Oh, you couldn't hear La La me? Land. No. All right, say it again. I said, which is a better movie, Crazy Stupid Love or La La Land? La La Land. All right, Did you hear me that time? Crazy Stupid Love. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't know you couldn't hear me. I should have slowed down. That was my fault. Yeah, that's okay. I'm a rookie. Yeah, I apologize. So, uh, Greg, you answered first. You're going to get 20 seconds to argue Crazy Stupid Love. Or, sorry, La La Land. Uh, go ahead, Greg. La La Land was the, one of the quintessential movies of last year, one of the best musicals, one of the best performances by Emma Stone. It was a great uh, follow-up from Whiplash for Damien Chazelle. Uh, it had a great, a better story, better movie, better music. Everyone was still talking about it afterwards. Um, the arc of Emma Stone's character as she goes from an actress to trying to become this great supporting, and it the ending where uh, they think they're going to get together, Ding. but they don't. All righty. Over to Jeremy for his opening on Crazy Stupid Love. You have 20 seconds whenever you're ready. Right. La La Land made a big impact, and it's had a huge backlash since then. It's a, it's a movie that's a little hard to relate to. People are singing and dancing. Crazy Stupid Love is a great romantic comedy. Steve Carell is hilarious and funny. Ryan Gosling in his mo a breakthrough role in the comedy genre. It's fun, it's engaging, and it's sexy at some moments. A way more fun movie to watch, and it's one that anyone can enjoy. La La Land is a little more specialized and a lot ding, ding. to get into. All right, go All righty. So, rebuttals, you got 10 seconds. Uh, Greg, we're going to go back to you. You got 10 seconds to wrap up La La Land. Ready? Whenever you're ready. Crazy Stupid Love is not a fun movie. Steve Carell's character gets bullied and uh, ashamed just because he has sex with people and when his wife cheated on him. La La Land is a better movie, better performances, better Oscars, more money, better everything. Crazy Stupid Love was not, a good, movie, not a good movie. And over to Jeremy, 10 seconds. When you right. start talking, I'll hit the timer. 
All right, La La Land sent people back to watch a lot of older musicals, and they realized how inferior La La Land is in comparison to the movies it was aping shamelessly. Crazy Stupid Love is a lot of fun. It's funny. It's entertaining. Steve Carell's character is totally relatable, and Ryan Gosling is hysterical. That time. Woof. Oh, my gosh. That was lots and lots and lots of great points. I hate the 2010 rule. It should be 30-15. I agree, but I'm new and don't make the rules. I just listen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I abide by what they say. That's I'm just the messenger here. Um, yeah, that was tough. Uh, I actually think I'm gonna give that one to Jeremy. That point yes. in his rebuttal about sending it back and making people rewatch the old stuff that it was What's ripping off. That... <laughs> you didn't get to make your point. <laughs> yeah, to make he, that he point. <laughs> he didn't say that it was an homage. He he used that point against La La Land, which I thought was a great like serious <laughs> argument. <laughs> what? Wow. <laughs> I disagree. I like La La Land more, but I thought the way that Jeremy argued Crazy Stupid Love in his opening, the way he went against La La Land in both his opening and his closing, I thought that went on Jeremy's head. Because he couldn't defend Crazy I... Stupid Love. Yeah, <laughs> he I said did. the same I said it's funny. He defend what he did this first time. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to. Well, he made another point about. Uh... He, did. he said the exact Steve Carell was a great performance and Ryan Gosling was funny. Those were his only two points about the movie. You said um, that you restated your La La Land's point, points, too. All right, all right anyway, we're gonna, I just we're gonna go. say, I shared that point with Mark and Draco. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to speed round two. <laughs> that was crap. The second question in the speed round. This one is not an either or. It's a little bit more open-ended, a little bit. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me yeah. this time? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Best Terminator movie. Two. One. All right. The ones I expected to be argued. I wouldn't think that uh, anyone was going to pull Genesis out of nowhere. All right. Uh, so Greg was first with T2 whenever you're ready. 20 seconds. T2 took everything that was great in T1 and made it better. It had a better villain, Robert Patrick, who had more abilities and more everything. It had this great character uh, dynamic between uh, Edward Furlong and Alice Schwarzenegger with his buddy, uh, uh, surrogate father uh, son thing and Linda Hamilton m- went from a uh, weak sub- uh, woman who was getting c- catered to the strong badass that would define her character and all other characters going forward. All right, lots of great points there for the original Terminator. Jeremy, whenever you're ready. The original Terminator is one of the most amazing movies ever made. On a low, low budget, they made this horrifying, entertaining, exciting action movie that had an epic love story that transcended time. There are very few movies like it, and the, the second one and a whole genre wouldn't exist without the first one. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, as that villain, is the villain. It's one of the most amazing villains you'll ever see. And time. All right, Greg, for 10-second rebuttals, whenever you're ready. The love story is rushed and a little contrived. Uh, the everything, the only people, everything remembers about the first movie is the line "I'll be back." The second movie has a better villain with Robert Patrick, who's much more menacing than Arnold Schwarzenegger was the first one. Arnold Schwarzenegger is this great uh, and relapse time. and rechange of the first movie, whereas Arnold Schwarzenegger comes back and kills. Time. And Jeremy, ten seconds when you're ready for T1. The idea of a robotic, mechanical killer that's coming after you and will never stop is a chilling, horrifying idea that was made in that movie, and it's scarier, and the movie is more immediate and more personal than the second one, which is a big and action time. movie. All right, yeah, that's, that's not a whole lot of time to get a lot of information, um, but from what I did hear, I thought Greg's opening just stole it for me, how it took yeah. everything that was good in the first one, improved upon it, made it not just bigger but better i thought greg had a better argument there um but there was definitely good points made by jeremy about two on how and especially in the rebuttal about the uh terrifying robot that's going to follow you and talk in a weird accent yeah there were great, <laughs> there were great points about how it made my movie better <laughs> <laughs> all right and the final speed around question the winner here this one is going to be 30 and 30 seconds and 20 seconds for the third one is a little bit more open-ended, so it will give you some time to think. Uh, this one is a question that I absolutely love. Uh, here we go. What is the most iconic superhero theme? Superman. <laughs> ah. Danny Elfman's Batman. 
All right. Two great themes, two great themes. Pull up one thing quickly before I start. All right, Greg, 30 seconds whenever you're ready. John Williams made what Superman is, and people have been trying to emulate and copy for the last 30 years since Superman came out. It is what we all want in a Superman movie. It's what we all want in a Superman theme because it shows you how great and how steadfast Superman is as an overall heroic, awesome character, the way it builds and builds and builds to where it's crashing down, to where it just gives you hope and belief in the ideals of Superman, whereas Danny Elfman is a great um, composer, but it's a little more or dark than anything. Uh, it fits well with the whole Tim Burton. Time, time, time. Alrighty, and over to Jeremy whenever you are ready. Superman is a theme done by John Williams in his prime that is really, it sounds a lot like Star Wars. It sounds a lot like Indiana Jones. It works for the movie, but Batman was a mind blower. When, this, when you heard that music with that title sequence, you were immediately introduced to Batman on the big screen in a way you'd never seen him before. And though that theme, it cr really created the mood that made that movie a huge blockbuster in a way that the Superman one didn't. We were seeing people fly. It was a, it was a big movie, but Batman really works because of the mood. Time. And now 20-second rebuttals. Greg, whenever you're ready, I'll start it. Tim Burton made the theme of Batman. Danny Elfman just parlayed that into something. John Williams made Superman what he was in that movie, which was this heroic, awesome character. Uh, Danny Elfman is very uh, d d d d d tragic, but it's not really encapsulating the essence of Batman where at, uh, just in those two movies, whereas Superman, every, people have been trying to emulate and copy. Uh, people did it better in Dark Knight. Tom's I'm in there. All right, Jeremy. I would say if you put the oh, sorry if you put the Superman no. theme in Indiana Jones, it would still work. It's just your it's a good heroic theme. Batman it it expresses everything about that character. It's moody, it's dark, it's rousing. It's got a march that comes in at the end. It is Batman, this awesome, dark yet heroic character. This tells you who the character is in a way the Superman one's more generic. Time. Woo! All right, I love this question, y'all probably gave two of the best answers. Um, half of me was hoping for a Danny Elfman versus Danny Elfman with Batman and Spider-Man, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. um, man, that was great. I, I need to look at the question. So the question is most iconic superhero theme. I, I think that the person who answered the question the best was Jeremy. I think that uh, the, wow. the points about, um, I, I think when he really said that it sounded like a lot of other John Williams music, that was the, the nail in the coffin for me because uh, John Williams, a lot of his music does sound the same, but uh, the Danny Elfman Batman theme fully encapsulated the character. And when he said the Superman theme could have been used in other movies, that was the biggest blow against the iconic nature and i don't think that greg made enough points against the batman theme <sighs> wow <laughs> all right wow so that was an adventure i guess <laughs> um, yeah so the final score there is going to be jeremy four greg three that was a nail where that was what yeah Great job for both of you, I thought, for almost every battle. I don't think there was ever a battle that somebody completely blew the other person out of the water for. No. I, in my opinion, you guys are two of the best fighters in the league. Yeah, uh, I'm sure we'll see you both um, back again. You are amazing, Greg. You, you, I'm in awe of you. And man, this was such an honor to be able to, to duel with you like this. Yeah, great job. Um. So what we're going to do is we'll start with Greg, actually. Where can people find you online if you want to do any plugs? Now's the time to do that. Uh, eventually, I'll bring back Debating the Dials at some point. Uh, that's where people can find me on the YouTube channel and all the other different uh, trivia sites around here. As I, uh, as I also win, there will be trivia. Um, but just want to say it was a great, uh, great fight, Jeremy. Um, uh, 
Uh, it was a great overall match. I'm glad uh, we uh, we challenged each other and made it uh, better <laughs> for what it was, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you guys both really, I think, elevated each other's games through every single question. So that was very entertaining as a both fan of this league and now as a judge. So fantastic job for both of you. Really great job. Uh, Jeremy, what do you want to plug? I have my YouTube channel, Jeremy Paul Adams. Um, if you're a fan of Calvin and Hobbes, I have a lot of Calvin and Hobbes fan videos that I made and did the music for. They're a lot of fun. And so I hope you guys will check that out. And then uh, me and my friends are, have just launched a new movie trivia channel, Full Metal Trivia. We're doing our first uh, trivia battles recording tomorrow on uh, Monday of, as of this recording, but they're going to be a lot more to come. It's going to be a lot of fun. So please check out Full Metal Trivia on Facebook and YouTube. And as for me, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd at RBRTPRKR98. It's a complicated handle, but get over it. Uh, so you can find me uh, at those places on the social medias there. Make sure, if you liked this video, if you liked this, these two amazing fighters, check all their stuff. Make sure you drop a like, drop a comment on this video. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, that way you can uh, get everything. Make sure you stay up to date with all the stuff happening around Movie Battleground, join the Facebook group. It's a great way to interact with fans, interact with players. Join that group, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, for everybody here at Movie Battleground, I'm Robert Parker. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.